Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Lodcast. And today we have the cast. Now we have Kuyo and HB from HB Productions, myself, the Biggie 15, and then Zorkanoff from Imperial Knowledge. Uh, today, our guest is Aramathias, and he's not going to be here at the current moment, but he will join in later on. So, with that, let's hop into uh, YouTube talks and catching up. So, how is everybody, first of all? How is everything going? It's pretty good, Doug. How are you? I'm doing phenomenal. I am sick as could be. I just woke up. <laughs> so, uh, I've been playing um, Elder Scrolls Blades all week, uh, all week, all weekend. My girlfriend hasn't been too happy with that because that way I did not have any attention for her. <laughs> so that's how yes. that happened. <laughs> they invited me to come play. They're like, hey, you're in the limited access beta. Come play. And I got in for like five minutes and then it kicked me out. I was like, thanks for playing, bro. <laughs> See you soon. And I was like, what the hell? Okay. Screw you guys. <laughs> Well, I wasn't in the initial pool, so in the first wave, but I was in the second wave, and it's been playing pretty well for me since then. You must then. have took my spot then, all right? The, 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 the problem <laughs> is that my, my phone is like, um, how do you call that? Like it's something worse than a potato. I, I play it at like 23 to maximum of 27 FPS, and sometimes have has dips into the low tens. I mean... It's terrible, but I'll plow through because I need to find all the lore. You gotta make YouTube videos on this somehow. I got, it's a free game and I can make money off it from YouTube. You don't think I'm not gonna do this. <laughs> and <laughs> speaking of which, uh, we can hop into our little YouTube section now. And the first mm. thing might help out with all of us, especially us who have bad phones. Google Stadia was announced. Now, for those who who don't know, basically... Google, I think it was like a few weeks ago, they came out with a announcement that they're making this big like cloud gaming service and it's like through YouTube. And essentially, if you see someone like playing a game on YouTube, a little thing will pop up and it'll say, you can play this game on whatever device you're on. And it, it looks to be really a game changer if it doesn't require really good internet. And... I'm assuming it will. Yeah, I mean, I've I've got some experience with game streaming by now. I mean, I haven't done it a lot, and my internet is pretty decent when I'm on the cable. I mean, it's 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 stable to say the least, and it's a lot faster than most people in the world. I think, especially in the United States, uh, I've heard because apparently you guys pay a lot for your bills yeah, while nothing comes out of it. <laughs> but I mean. <laughs> Even then, the game streaming that I've seen so far has always been very laggy and it, it never really worked well. But I think that if there's a company that can pull it off, it, it's probably Google. I mean, I, I don't have any confidence in Google Stadia at this point. I'm not, I'm not investing any hope in it, to, to be fair. But if they can make it work and if it's at least at a well manageable price point, like not that you have to pay $60 per month, but that you can maybe pay like... Like the double of Netflix, like twenty dollars a month, and then you can play games. I mean, that would be amazing, but it would have to work first. And as you said, you probably need a very, very good internet connection for it to work. I actually have been playing a ridiculous amount of PlayStation now because I have a seven-day free trial, and mm -hmm. I got to go back into my childhood and play the Sly Cooper games. I I love those games, and PlayStation now is twenty dollars a month, and you get. And a wide variety of games you can play. However, the amount of lag I experience playing it is makes the games unplayable at sometimes because it, it you have to it stops the game short. I I remember the first boss I played in the uh, in this and I was playing Sly Three. It took me roughly forty five minutes to beat him, and I it, it's a very easy boss, but I died three times because it just kept lagging over and over and over again, and I would speed itself up, and I would get hit like six times and die, and I'd be like, okay, this is very frustrating for a boss I've beaten on the PlayStation Two so many times. I need I need something to go smoothly. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what, I mean, if there's any, like I said, if there's any company that has the knowledge and the kind of servers to pull this off in an at least semi-stable way, it's probably Google. But I mean, the previous streaming services for games networks, their track records haven't been that great. So 
I don't really have my hopes up yet, but I'll have to see more Bima first. I do like uh, that controller though. Google could definitely shove in their Google dollars and fund it basically. Maybe and make I- it work. Yeah, I think an uh, inter- interesting yeah. thing about that is that uh, they showed off Assassin's Creed Odyssey, which has like an already pretty low uh, uh, response time on consoles, specifically Xbox One, I think. So when they showed it off in comparison to an Xbox One, it didn't look laggy at all because it's already laggy on the Xbox One. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, there's even there's even an Assassin's Creed Odyssey version for the Switch you can stream in Japan, and apparently it plays pretty well as long as you're on the cable and you're paying for full speed internet like the max you can get there. But anything below that, I mean, it's it's lag o'clock. Yeah, and with that, that, we can hop on to something else that happened after, like, 20 years. Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines 2 was announced. I know nothing about this. Okay, so (laughs) basically, uh, there's a game. I actually haven't played it, but it came out like... I know of this game. Only tangentially, because one of my best friend's brothers played this. (laughs) Yeah, so so basically, years ago, it came out. And it was, from what I hear in the YouTube videos I've seen, one of the best RPG games to ever exist. And it became, it didn't do so well on release, but it became a cult classic. And we're finally getting a sequel, and there's there's a bit of a, a bit of controversy around it, uh, specifically on genders. I mean, I, f- I frankly don't care, because I, I mean, that helps with the RPG experience. <laughs> okay, no, I, I don't think there's enough I can milk out of that one. Let's just go to the Epic Game Store one. Uh, do you guys all know about this? It's Epic. I yeah, I heard a little I, bit I know about, about it. The, I know about the controversy. Yeah, at least a bit of it. Yeah. So basically, it turns out that uh, the you know the people who made Fortnite, the uh, Epic Games, and they also make uh, uh-huh. the Unreal Engine, they made a store that basically is competition for Steam. But it's not because it's not competition in the traditional manner with prices and stuff, but the fact that they're stealing exclusives that were originally going to launch on Steam. Like, I think a really good example of that was Metro Exodus. Mm. Yeah, yeah you stole quite the exclusive there because of mean, how well that did. I, I heard Metro Exodus was pretty good, though. And it was pretty I heard it good, didn't sell too well. Like- yeah, not not too many people were interested yeah, in it. If it's on, for if some it's, reason, if it's on the Epic Game Store, I don't think anyone on PC. I mean, even even it. on consoles. I mean, uh, I really had expected this game to do better when I saw the announcement at the original E3 where it was announced. I was really excited, but I mean, I haven't heard anything about the game ever since. I mean, sure, I heard the controversy, but not about anyone in my friend group enjoying it. I mean, it it failed a bit. <laughs> Okay, let's not say anything about that then. <laughs> I, no, I'm trying to think of, uh, of a good way to say it. Uh, to like, say what I want to say. You, you nailed uh, a lot of stuff there too, so it's like, all right, well, what what to say now? <laughs> okay, let's move on. Who wanna who wanna go open up a plantation? Oh man, you're the one. You're the one dealing with this like firsthand. Article thirteen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'm out of business soon, so I have to open up a plantation. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'm not going to get any money anymore. Yeah, Article 13 happened. This is our last topic for this little section. Uh, and Zork, I think you were can we explain even, this the even, best. Were we even done about the Epic Game Store? I mean, let's be honest. This is more important. This is probably going to take up like the bulk of this section. Well, the thing is, okay, so let, let me explain. And... Uh, well, let me, as a European, I can kind of explain what it's all about, but a little disclaimer, I have not yet read the full thing. I only know its intentions and I know what I've heard from people that can know about what's actually in it. Once it's through the commission, I'll probably read the entire thing because I want to know how things stand. But right now, it's not through the commission yet, although don't get your hopes up of it being blocked in the commission because they would never send it to the commission if uh, they did not have full confidence that it was going to go through. I mean, unless a key state like Germany changes its position on it, it's just going to pass. But the idea is that all big sites on the internet will have to do, uh, will have to take measures to the best of their abilities to keep copyrighted stuff off their sites or at least license it once it's on there. Uh, So that means that things like Creative Commons 
licensing thing, things are still fine. Things were, uh, were licensed under Creative Commons licensing. They can be used under anyone's videos. But for example, uh, let's take Bethesda, the people that make it so that we all have jobs at this moment. I mean, if they were to say, for example, uh, yeah, we want to have YouTube license all our stuff, otherwise people can't use it, then YouTube would have to take away all the Elder Scrolls stuff from their site, or at least in Europe, to make sure that Bethesda can't claim an enormous sum of money on them. That's the idea. So what's going to be needed is upload filters on basically not only YouTube, but on every platform on the internet. So Twitch, Twitter, Facebook. And as I've preached from the very beginning, on YouTube we have had a system like this for a very long time. We've had the copyright strikes. And it's basically going to be that, but everywhere around the internet. And it could become worse than it is on YouTube. Again, we don't know yet how it will be implemented. I mean, we have a draft of how the European Parliament would like to see it implemented. The problem is that the way that, from what I have seen so far, and I can't really uh, explain the entire thing uh, as I've seen it, but for, uh, for what I've seen so far is really clear to me that it's not really enforceable realistically in the way that it's in there now. If they would say you have to keep yourself to this this exact enforcement, then YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, it would be almost impossible for them to make sure that it's being kept off. So their only choice would be if they don't want to pay a lot of money to either only allow certain creators with pre-reviewed videos in the European zone or just go away from Europe altogether and close your entire site to, to Europe. But at this point, it's really up to how will it be enforced? Because we don't know that yet. Because even if this law as it stands will pass, if it can't be enforced, and if major players like YouTube, Facebook and Twitter see themselves forced to leave the EU, the, the law will, I mean, I can almost guarantee you that the law will be sent back and that they won't send YouTube, Facebook and Twitter out because I think 90% of all of Europe uses Facebook uses these platforms, so they can't just kick them out. So for now, I'm optimistic because I think that this can be workable and that we won't hit we won't be hit too hard. Because from my perspective, from what I've seen through the uh, for, through the last few months, the people that are pro this law, they want to make it seem like nothing's going to change. Well, certainly things are going to change. And the people who are against this law make it seem like it's the end of the world, which is also not going to be what it's going to be. I think the biggest issue with it uh, for me personally is that there is now a government that has put down a precedent that they're allowed to control what you can consume and what they feel is right and wrong, which I think is immoral just from a standpoint where a government can control what you consume because this is copyright to them. You're not allowed to have this. I think that's I mean, the biggest it's not issue. The government that a lot of people... who, who, who says you can't watch it. It's, it's well, no, the no, no. That, that they've makes put the, down the copyright. Like, well, no, they've put down like a system of law which says you can watch this because it's free for you to watch. Everything else is copyright. You have to pay the publisher for this, which I think is just immoral. I mean, a publisher. I mean, you, you can't illegally download films for the law. It's 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 essentially what are you the same about, because the people who made it. I can illegally download films all I want. I, I know, I know you can do it. I know uh, you can do it. Nah, but I mean, it's it's not allowed. <laughs> you get what I mean, guys. Please and don't snitch on me. Essentially, oh, the copyright buddy. strike. Well, as the law currently stands, it's down to the platform providers to prevent pirated content. Anyway, it's yeah, to, to it, the best of their abilities. It's yeah, basically. Yeah, so, that's, so this, that's the hinging point. Yeah, this is almost an extension of that of that sort of logic. This is kind of it taken to its logical conclusion that platform providers are now being obliged to formally do what they should have been doing anyway. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. most likely going to be something like the upload filters we've had for years now on YouTube, but then on the bigger platforms as well, like Facebook, Twitter, etc. And mm -hmm. under the current law, small platforms, so platforms with under, I believe, 50,000 users, they are exempt from it anyway. So people that can't pay for that kind of upload filters, they are exempt from it either way. 
And the way it's going to be impacted is how are Google and Facebook's lawyers going to be able to Im- to Im- interpret the law and are going to be able to defend the to the best of our abilities thing. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of which, it's not a politics podcast, and our guest is finally here. HP, take it away. Our guest this week is the one and only Aaron Mathias. Um, as Wait, most you, of you so, probably sorry, know. Sorry, 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 but is it Aramithius or Aramithias? I really Aramith- need to know that. <laughs> Aramithius is how I say it, but okay. I'm open to pretty much everything. Anyways, as I was saying, Aramithius, uh, as I have been so graciously corrected, is... Um, what I consider one of the biggest powerhouses of lore, or lore knowledge, considering all of us, uh, Zork and Biggie can attest to this, have asked this one man for help on our lore videos, at least once in our lifetime. So, Aramithius, what do you do exactly on YouTube? Um, on YouTube, I've recently started doing a mixture of, a mixture of things. Um, I started off because I'm thoroughly lazy and got scared of video editing software, um, producing a podcast rather than um, looking at YouTube. Um, so I kind of t- start, started that started that off and then kind of gravitated towards doing shorter take stuff um, for for YouTube basically that's a lot more ad libbed than my sta- than my standard podcast. I, I script out my podcast. I don't generally do that for the stuff I've been putting on YouTube, which is generally kind of if I have a hot take on a particular thing, I'll put that out on YouTube. That's only happened once so far because ESO elsewhere came out. Um, I've also been doing a series of close readings of Elder Scrolls texts. So we'll go I'll go through a particular book and kind of stop and say, well, this means this, this links to that, this is re- referencing this event, and so on and so forth. So, con- so contextualizing specific texts, saying, pointing out what all the symbols are, where there are symbols, where it fits within the broader law, anything you need to consider about that particular text, that sort of thing. What got you into this, uh, the whole YouTube side of things, exactly? Uh, well, specifically, it was... Um, what got me into what got me into content creation in general and, and podcasts were if i can start there because that's more or less where things kick off um was me basically looking for more stuff like the selectives lawcast um those podcasts are fantastic and they appear on youtube and and that's where i kind of got into the elder scrolls podcast rabbit hole and was thinking well wouldn't it be great if there was some more stuff like this that actually went through and explained half the stuff these guys are talking about in quite an offhanded way can we just look at the sources and go through um, and do that is there anywhere that does that and no there's an awful lot of stuff that talks about um how that talks about what the races are what the locations are and that sort of thing but the the uh, more complex side of it didn't really get addressed the point where where I was um, I was happy with it basically, and so I was thinking, okay, so I'm gonna st- I, I, so I, this stuff isn't there. I can produce this stuff. I just need to actually look into it. Um, the YouTube side specifically was me was me thinking, well, how can I put th- how can I repackage this into another format? How can I make this format a bit more YouTube friendly? My um, podcasts are. A little, ra- a little rambly, and not necessarily something that you want to sit, um, have a have a full video for. But I've been coming around to the idea that maybe it wouldn't be such a bad idea to m- to move that stuff online um, onto YouTube. Um, and the ESO elsewhere announcement was kind of the catalyst. Um, I was chatting with some of the guys at the Dungeon Crawler Network, um, and Ag in, and Agelus in particular was very, very, very annoyed at the way that dragons in the ESO and elsewhere were put forward. So I just thought, well, how does how do all the lore stuff that um, that we already have link to the stuff that's been announced in this particular video? So I scribbled down a few notes and fired up my webcam and just said, right, here's my, t- here's my take on all the lore that we just heard in the ESO elsewhere announcement. And it wound up being about 20 minutes worth of chat. And then I thought, well, I've started this thing now. I need to do something at least once a week now. Otherwise, YouTube's algorithm is going to forget me. So I started doing the um, the close readings as that because I can literally just read the text through, make a few notes and pretty much ad lib the rest. 
Well, before we uh, hop on to another topic, is there yeah. anything that you would like to plug or something that you'd like the viewers to check? Um, well, um, not anything, not anything specifically, uh, but just keep an, keep an eye out for, um, written in uncertainty podcasts where, um, I'll either be, um, presenting one particular question or going through a particular text within the Elder Scrolls universe. Um, I was kind of originally intending it to be that I run the texts as a weekly thing and the podcast as a fortnightly thing, but that was frankly killing me. Um, so I'll be doing one week is a text, one week is a question, one week is a text, one week is a question, um, which will now start to be being uploaded to YouTube as well as the as well as the various podcast formats and podcatchers. And I, in terms of specific projects, I am getting someone who. Um, who frankly makes me look like an idiot child with the law um, to talk about how souls work in Elder Scrolls. We're still working out the details of when and where that's going to happen, but I'm hoping that will be at some point within the next month. Nice. Well, okay then. Uh, we can move on to the lore section, the real meat of this podcast. So this is the part of the podcast where we talk about the lore and throughout the Elder Scrolls universe. Obviously, this is the main bulk of what we all do and what we all enjoy talking about. So with the first topic, we're going to talk about the concept of time in the Elder Scrolls universe. Uh, for example, the Kalpas, maybe, and their effect on the gods and the Daedra, or even the um, the dragon breaks that go on throughout the Elder Scrolls universe. Yeah, so I actually asked this question, and my real issue with this comes from, like, how exactly gods work in between Kalpa switches. Like, we know kind of from things in Coda with Lorcan how there's the whole possibility of him kind of not changing throughout Kalpa's and just reincarnating, I think, if I interpreted that right. But then, what happens to gods like Akatosh, the time god himself, and then even the other gods? Like, do they get reborn as a different god and do they keep their memories or are they like the mortal beings who just kind of reset and don't know anything about the previous Kalpa except for the fact that it might have existed? Well, if you take the Red Guard creation myth as talking about Kalpas, which I think is reasonable, uh, they talk about the jumping between world skins and that sort of thing. Um, there's a line in that that talks about um, how they couldn't, they weren't really anything but what they remembered from before. So I think there are hints that the gods persist p between Kalpas or the Etada persist between Kalpas and they can carry on existing. Um, although that precise line, now I think about it, might be an Argonian thing. I can't remember exactly. Um, but the Red Guards with the jumping between skins definitely have them carrying on between Kalpas. Um, there is is also something about how Molag Baal was the chief of the Drow in the 36 Lessons. So there is some suggestion that they can kind of change roles and will kind of carry on um, in various different capacities that they kind of reshuffle um, within the different Kalpas um, and between Kalpas. But I don't think that their identity particularly changes. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I'm tr I'm still trying to remember what that the kind of the core text for this is, whether it's whether it's Red Guard or Argonian. But um, it's bas basically that they will remember they will remember things, but once they kind of get reduced down to being the Etada uh, that exist within this particular Arabis, then they possibly don't quite remember. How to get back is the way that the Red Guard myth talks about it. But I think what happens is that they get stripped down to being something else, uh, being a different version of themselves that can't access their their past lives, if you like. The things that happen on Mundus is different from what happens in Aetherius and that sort of thing. That's how I reconcile the idea that you've not got these be um, that you've not really got these beings that know that they've existed for aeons and are trying to do something in particular. I think possibly because Lorcan gets his heart torn out, um, he's possibly the exception here. If you look at Shaw, son of Shaw, there's the very definite idea that Lorcan is trying to achieve something as the Kalpas go on. 
there um, when you look at our, the, the precise line is something like um, that each of your fathers here with me are with you every time you spit out your doom um, and you keep, you keep on beating the drum of war and maybe this time you will win or a line roughly like that which suggests that Kalpas are sequential you get the one after the other um, which is a bit weird if you think that the god of time, who is time, potentially gets unwound at the end of every Kalpa. You get a time beyond time, but there is a sense of that within a few texts that you can get a time without Akatosh in some way, or at least a duration without Akatosh between Kalpas. Whether that's the same kind of time as we experience in Mundus, uh, don't know, but places like the Anuad and the and several parts of the monomyth and especially children of the root um talk about a time outside of all the arabuses interesting so basically there's a potential of time existing without a time god yes if you take the anuad um ex- at its word um the time begins when anu and padme come into the void there is also it's it's in an, it's in an, it's in another text, but it's basically saying that um, that time will move that time will move on, and the time before Mundus happens, there are experimentations going on. That the gods are trying things out and beginning again and learning and beginning again. Which, if everything is happening outside of time, everything would happen all at once and everything wouldn't make sense in that kind of sequential learning sort of way. So I think there kind of has to be some sort of time outside of Akatosh that is affecting the is, is affecting Aetherius maybe, but not in the way that time exists on Mundus. I guess to that end, I'd have to ask if that kind of time exists outside of Akatosh and affects Aetherius separately, would the battle between Padme and uh, Anu also be cyclical, or would that just be a one-time thing that just happened once, and now time on the plane of Mundus is cyclical, so to the people of Mundus, it seems like it happens every time? I'm not totally sure. Um, if you take the idea that Anu is the Amaranth and take how that works literally, um, the moment that Anu becomes this Aurobis that becomes this version of of the Elder Scrolls universe um, is after Nier is dead and he's and he's fl- and he's sent Padme away after beating him once. Um, so you've got that happening outside of the Aurobis entirely, and then a new version of time begins once Anu becomes the Amaranth. If you don't subscribe to the idea of Anu as the Amaranth and think that Anu and Padme is all part of the same cycle, I might almost have to revert to an Inception metaphor, if you like. That when you go down into subgradients, um, each level of subgradients um, and if each different type of god, then time potentially changes as well. So you've got Anu and Padme time, and then you've got Anuiel Sithis time, and then you've got Oriel and Lorcan time and each of those pairings is kind of shifting down a level like the way that the dream within a dream time works in in Inception when you go down into the next layer of dream then hours within the current dream that you're in become seconds of the dream that you entered from if you does that make sense do you do you see where I'm coming from yeah, I, th- I think that's that answers a little bit of it, but there's still this whole like unclarity to the whole thing, and I don't think uh, that's ever going to get answered because I feel like <laughs> Bethesda wants that air mystery to the whole the unreliable what theory. is time. Mm. I don't want to be disrespectful to anyone, and I hope that you guys realize that. But I respect Aramithius Goyo. I respect you guys for the knowledge that you have on these kind of two subjects. But I'm you have to realize there. that most people <laughs> within the community don't really buy into the theories. And that 
it's basically to most people it will sound like overcomplication for the sake of overcomplication by fans who don't have much on time other than time on their hands and while i respect the theories that come out of it and some of them are plausible they sometimes contradict what we have in licensed material and that's mm-hmm. what i wish to say i mean again i respect the time that's put into it and i respect the enthusiasm that people have and how it enriches the community itself however i do wish to say that i disagree with most of it and let's mm-hmm. i i've 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 accepted for a long time that i mean i'm not going to convince people that it isn't true and people are not going to convince me that it's true but I feel like I had to say it for the sake of since I'm here. At oh least. yeah, that's completely I mean, understandable. Again, again I, res- I respect it completely, and I'm not gonna say that it isn't true, or it's just that I personally don't buy into it. Yeah, I think sure. a great example think- of that was with uh, the little, you know, the bug pots in Skyrim, and how we were all making crazy theories about what they actually are, when in reality it was just like a cancelled quest. <clears throat> yeah. Once, was- sorry. So you know how there's those jars in Skyrim that have the bugs in them and the marks? Oh them? yeah, right. Yeah, we all made up those theories about it and what they could be and all that. I'll yeah. tell you what they are. They're a global conspiracy to bring around the Kaji end times. Yeah, sure. But no, Zork, I, t- I totally hear what you're what you're saying on that, and that's why I'm saying, well, if you subscribe to the idea of the amaranth and and so on, or if you take particular text on board, um, it's something that is kind of within within the community but if i was gonna say if if you don't look at the amaranth and sure son of sure and those and those sorts of texts it's it's there's still those hints within um within within the books that um that suggest that and i'm just trying to think of ways to try and reconcile how that might work i'm I'm currently heading a bit ahead of myself because i was actually going to bring this up uh, at another date when i have some more preparation done on the on the on the subject however Mm -hmm. something that personally very much interests me is that especially i have the feeling that here's here's my lack of preparation coming through because again i was planning to bring this up in like a month or something when i've worked a bit more on it but the texts that, uh, even the in-game texts that contain hints uh, to certain subjects, and also the texts written out of game by the subjects, they have all been written by a certain person. I mean, I think that Mr. Talks even said something on it, like the the untrustworthy narrator. How can we know that the person that wrote the things down and that they are, who are saying things about, for example, the amaranth? How can we know that those people? know what they are talking about, the people that wrote it down, and that in in the universe, of course. And how can we know that that's not just religion? Like, for example, the ancient, the ancient Egyptians, the priests there, the local priests, they made they just made up whatever story worked best for him and to make it to them, for them, and to make it seem the most complicated thing they could make it so that the people wouldn't ask more questions. And to a lot of people, it will sound like that. Like, the people are just, the people in this community are it, it sounds like sometimes they are making things overly complicated for the sake of being complicated, so they won't be asked too hard of questions about it. And basically, those are those are two things combined in one question. Uh, the, the first thing was, how do we know that the texts are reliable that we are interpreting here? Or at least that, that part of the community is interpreting. Yeah, we kind of don't, um, is, the, is the quick answer there. But um, if you are going to go to talk about these particular subjects um like i'll take if we take chim just purely as an example um where it's explicitly mentioned by name and kalpas is another the references are kind of uh, are not really there in in an awful lot of places so you almost have to assume that the texts that you have aren't misleading you simply to have anything to talk about at all uh, I, I, to- I totally take your point that um that that Manka Cameron could be entirely spinning rubbish to get um, to get you to go along with um, with his ideas when he talks about Numantia, for example. But I think you kind of have to, if you want to start thinking about what those terms might mean, have to at least start by thinking that they might that they're not deliberately trying to mislead. There has to be a certain charity I mean, of interpretation there. I personally but, think that we have to treat this. If we're going to go about uh, even assuming that there's a grain of truth, we have to treat this like we would treat a historical event. 
Yeah. If it has many uh, sources that are either primary or secondary, but from different points of view, there's a pretty good chance that it is based on something. And something like uh, the Amaranth or the, how time works, a lot of them tend to, in lore, have multiple points of view. So there has to be something there. Which well, I explain, feel... explain to me why, if we have multiple points of view, and for example, we have text where we don't exactly know what the motives were of the person that wrote it down, why mm. do we view it as history and why do we not view it as religion? Because if you would view it as religion, it would mean that it could be untrue, but it could still be worth studying. Exactly. I think that's a very good point you make because religion is always based in some form in reality. There's things that people misinterpret because memories in general, I think, I forgot the name of the effect, but if someone else tells a memory, then your your own recollection of that memory is going to be changed. So if we apply that to the Elder Scrolls, there's a very big chance that all these things actually happen. Like, for example, the creation myths and all the races, just that it's not exactly how we see it. But there's probably a definite truth, it's just we don't know exactly what it is. And I think that... These texts are our best way of getting to them. Yeah, that's probably where our opinions diverge, but I completely respect it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the next topic is, I think I believe this is Aramathias's, uh Necromancers, souls, and identity in the Elder Scrolls. So would you take that away, Aramathias? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> sure, this was just came out as more or less a, a, little, a little teaser from what I was thinking and trying to structure my thoughts around for um for ch i'm having a chat with scourgicus about it um but precisely what are souls within um within the elder scrolls universe we don't really get that clear of an answer of an answer i think it's possibly because they use the word soul for literally everything where they could try and use a different word sometimes please um because when you say um, soul trap something, you're not literally holding the person's identity within that gem unless you're doing something very specific. Even when you look at black soul gems, uh, that the gem itself doesn't hold the identity of a person unless you gerrymander it in a very specific way. So if you're thinking about what a person is, is a person, dis is a person distinct, from their s is distinct from their soul? Are you seeing things that um, it could, because the, their personhood winds up in the soul can if you're using a black soul gem, for example. Whereas for a white soul gem, you don't have any idea of where the person, where the personhood of, or the thinking part of the animal that you've just soul trapped has gone. There's just soul energy there. There's not really a soul in the sense of a self. So I'm just kind of in the middle of my investigations as to whether the whether the Elder Scrolls has a, that much of a coherent idea of how identity works and is related to souls and so on. The possibly the best way that I can think of of, su of kind of summarizing it is that I think the Elder Scrolls is working off something like an Aristotelian model of how souls work, if you like. Um, Aristotle. Um, suggested that souls were kind of progressive, if you like. You had vegetable souls, which plants have, um, which just have the ability to grow and live and all that good stuff. Then you have animal souls, which are possessed of the ability to sense and react in a way that plants don't and in a way have kind of memories and stuff. And then you have the reasoning soul, which people have. And so you can then think and do various other stuff um, with a reasoning soul that you can't with the other two types of soul. So that feel, um, there's talk uh, of a soul's animus when you look at how the vestige in ESO is constructed, for example, um, and the way that soul shriven are made. They are kind of Di diverted instead of going to the soul can they go to cold harbor and the personhood gets broken down into energy eventually in a way that doesn't really happen elsewhere but you still get your soul your soul trapping and your black so and your black soul gem and that sort of thing you still got that soul energy rather than the soul itself so i think there's something going on there that at least suggests um a kind of an aristotelian model of the soul 
within the Elder Scrolls universe. On that note, I also think that souls in the Elder Scrolls universe, yeah, there's there's the concept of mind body dualism when it comes to consciousness, and I know I know a lot of people don't subscribe to it. I don't personally, but I think in the Elder Scrolls universe, there's a lot to do with it because our character in ESO gets separated from their soul, and yet they still maintain what they are. So there's always the potential that our character isn't real. There's a separation between what they are and what controls them. There's, there may even be a potential higher being up in Aetherius that is controlling us. Or maybe our soul is just that of one of the original spirits back when Aetherius was first created that's perhaps pulling all the strings. But I, I really do feel that there is a separation between the soul and the body and what exactly it is that makes up the consciousness of our characters. Yeah, absolutely. That's um, the kind of distinction there that you're talking between the, between the soul and the thinking part. Um, it was kind of why I want them to use more words. If they talk about the spirit as the identity and the soul as the energy that animates, then we could, and then it'll perhaps be a more productive conversation because you can actually split out the parts a lot better. But when you're thinking about um, mind-body dualism specifically, I think that the way that the souls are constituted within the Elder Scrolls makes it that makes it that much more obvious than it is in our own world, say, because um, there's various arguments that show that mind-body dualism can't really be a thing. Um, you look at uh, Wittgenstein's private language argument, for example. Um, there's the idea of Basically, if you decide to describe something that you experience in a language which is known only to you, and if there was a concrete difference between your mind or your soul and your body, then you should be able to reliably relay what that sensation is because you've got a point of comparison between your mind and your body. But you can't really do that because you're reliant on your because you're reliant on memory and you've got no external reference point because of the way you are as an embodied thing. Then you can't make that sort of difference. So, so the mind soul this or the mind body distinction rather can't really be the case because you can't make those sorts of comparisons. Whereas within the Elder Scrolls, I think you absolutely can. Because you've got those definite, se- you've got those definite separations in different stages of the soul. Not to mention the possible consequences of how memory relates to all this. If you look at the quote about in ESO about how memories of dead things become water, there's that separation between the soul and the soul energy and memory and the body, and there's all sorts of different moving parts that kind of allow that sort of comparison. And speaking of which, now that we are kind of through our lore bit and due to some scheduling conflicts, we're just going to jump into the next portion of our podcast, which is whatever you want to talk about. And I think this part was from Zork. Uh, and it's basically the Elder Scrolls Blades. Uh, what is it? Anything we want to talk about from Blades? Well, I mean, I talked about it really shortly with Aramithius yesterday. And what we, there's a, at least what, what, Arimetheus already told me was uh, it probably takes place in Cyrodiil, and I actually completely agree on it. Uh, and a lot of people indeed think that it takes place in Cyrodiil since we see a lot of alien ruins, and it's really uh, the, the, the buildings are at least in a semi Cyrodiil style. Um, but I personally think that it's on one of the islands around Cyrodiil, for example, like Sturk, those kind of islands that have alien uh, buildings on it, but are also quite remote. Because in a certain quote from one of the people in inside your town, uh, if you get them inside your town, is, is she says something like, "We don't get many visitors here since we are so far away from the empire." And yet, it's really Cyrodiilic culture and also like Cyrodiilic landscape, and it has those alien ruins. So, I probably think that it's on an island like Sturk, something like that. It doesn't have to be Sturk itself, but I think that it's on an island like See, it. Based on what I've seen, I. I... Because we there is the area of Craglorn in ESO, which certain parts do look a lot like Cyrodiil in it. So there's always the chance that it might be that. But I think the idea of an island makes a lot more sense. It would explain the isolation, the reason why we don't really get a concrete like place where it takes uh, yeah. where it is. And if you look outside out of the the gate that you have at the there's like a wall and then there's the gate. 
And if you look out of it, you see that there's a small harbor with the ship. So, I mean, it could still be a, uh, a city on the coast, but I think that they want to make it sort of clear that it's an island, like an is isolated little place where they can ju just throw at you whatever they want. Like, it's never going to be relevant to anything else in the story. Yeah, so if that's all we have to say, we can move on to the little bit of Bethesda, their PAX presence, uh, the 25th anniversary, and E3. And so uh, I'll sum it up a bit. So Bethesda, there was an event recently called uh, PAX East here in America that Bethesda actually went to. And we, we learned a few things about ESO. I think one of the streams is still going on right now, which is the ESO one. Uh, there was the seven, Fallout 76 stream. And in general, we... Todd, he kind of isn't too good at keeping his mouth shut. And we learned a lot of things that we didn't know previously. But that's not really what I'm here to talk about. Because the, the, the live stream isn't... Since it's Fallout 76, most people don't really care about it, except maybe me. But they did apologize a lot for it. They, they said that it was... It didn't end up the way they wanted. And it was the first time they ever did something like this. But then... There's the 25th anniversary video that they released, and there's a lot of juicy stuff in that. Uh, firstly, we got glimpses at uh, what may be Fallout, not Fallout, uh, what may be Elder Scrolls 6, with them discussing how they're doing photogrammetry to basically scan in things like rocks from the actual world to use in game. And then there's uh, the fact that uh, Shirley Curry, I'll talk about this later on, but. Because that is one of the community questions, but basically Skyrim Grandma was scanned into the game, which is really, really good because that means that they're listening to the community. And then finally, there's the bit with E3, which basically Todd confirmed that uh, Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 weren't going to be. It. So what is everyone's thoughts? Uh, if they're using photogrammetry, I don't think we're going to be seeing Elder Scrolls 6 until at least 2025. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, did anyone expect it before 2030? Not me, at least. Uh, I kind of gave up on it. It's, it's this. I feel like it's gonna evolve into the same situation that we've had with uh, uh, Half Life Three. It's never coming. I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's coming, but not anytime soon. And I somehow also doubt that the things that we saw in the in the Elder Scrolls. I mean, I, I haven't studied it any uh, closely, so I can't really say it. Uh, without a doubt, but I personally think that the things we saw were probably for Starfield the, and that they are using the same technology later on for Elder Scrolls 6 because in an interview after Elder Scrolls uh, after E3, Todd literally said that Starfield at, did, at this moment is sort of playable and Elder Scrolls 6 isn't playable at all because it's in pre-production and if they're not even ready to share a Starfield trailer at the coming E3 I don't think that they're really working on that level in Elder Scrolls 6. I mean, I mean, I may be wrong. I'm probably wrong, but I don't think they're working, working on that kind of level yet on Elder Scrolls 6 if they don't even have Starfield ready for a trailer yet. I mean, ready for a trailer does not mean ready to play, but at least in such a length that you can show something, but apparently that they're not willing to do that yet. Yeah, so uh, if that's everything, any does anyone have any comments Ooh. on that? I do have a thought on that. Um, it's that they were saying that they were going to be using the same sort of technology for Elder Scrolls 6 as with Starfield. So I was kind of thinking that, that once Starfield has its debut is, play is playable and so on, we can probably expect something like an accelerated development for ES6. They can get a lot of the scripting done, they can get voice acting done, they can do everything that doesn't really doesn't really rely on the technology done before you have the engine so to speak you can get um the the quest that you want done and scripted and um at least um, plotted out so once they have the technology down for starfield then hopefully it should be plug and play for es6 yeah, yeah I, I, I i very much agree with that because when the engine well the gamebryo engine was converted from net immerse to gamebryo for oblivion fallout three came out in like i think two years afterwards which for bethesda is extremely fast yeah, mm -hmm. i agree i agree with it once once starfield will drop i mean we'll probably see elder scrolls 6 within two years or something but yeah i mean if if they're really as ambitious as they claim they 
this and if it's really going to be their redemption from Fallout 76 from Bethesda Game Studios, I think it'll be a long way off. I mean, Starfield probably at the very earliest 2021. I mean, very earliest, I think. I could be wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but I fear for it. Yeah, so if that's all we have, then we can move on to the lightning round. <coughs> the best part of the podcast that everyone loves. So the lightning round, for those of you who don't know, is questions by the community that we have to answer in under five minutes. So first question, what is your favorite story from the test universe? I'm going to have to say the story of uh, Marwin's main quest line. I, th- I say it because I just like the idea of reincarnation and all that stuff and how it was all predestined and also like walking through the ash looks pretty cool in cinematics. I think my favorite story is probably the story of the Mead dynasty from from Titus Mead the first up until the very last part of Skyrim. Not, I mean, I know that a lot of people hate it, but because it focuses on the political and uh, side of the lore and just the geopolitical factors a lot more than we've seen in previous entries because there are now more nations on Tamriel. I mean, that that's what interests me. So I really, really, really enjoy that story. I have to copy um, Kui, um, copy Kuyo at this point, I'm afraid. Um, Mor- Morrowind's, ma- Morrowind's main quest is one of the few that I've um, that I've seen, even with the um, the subsequent games, that actually has that sense of this is something that's been going on for centuries. This is this is the actual culmination of a thing. They go to an awful lot of trouble to build up the feeling that you are plugged into an already existing situation and the, the narrative between Nerevar and the Tribunal and Dagoth Ur, how those characters are developed both in the in-game texts and the quests, I think is absolutely beautiful because you do kind of get invested in a way that I haven't really felt uh, with other Elder Scrolls quest lines, so to speak. Um, all right, let's hop on to the next question. What is your favorite NPC in the test games? And you don't have to be serious. You can joke on this one. It's whatever you guys want to put forward. Dagother. If you think about it, the way he came to be is probably the most, like, meaty part of Marwin's story. Like, he didn't just choose to be evil. He, he, he made a decision. Even At the end, he even gives you the choice to talk to him. He doesn't just say, eh, I'm an evil villain. I'm going to fight you for power he wants to restore Marwyn to some former glory that it was. And he doesn't want to fight Nerevar. He even said it, I would have offered you the ability to side with me, though now I have to kill you. He, it's like, he's a very complex character that I feel Tez needs a lot more of. My favourite's got to be Master Aion from House Telvani, uh, simply because of how you interact with him. He's You kind of get a sense both from what he says to you and some of the stuff that you see around his um, around his tower and the things that he's doing within the local community. He's desperately trying to reform House Chelvani and make it this this big thing, this com- this potentially compassionate thing actually um, in how in how he's trying to get the house to move forward. But and you also and you get that sense of him taking you under your wing, guiding you through the process of being something great in House Telvani, and so you get. I got quite attached to him, to be honest, when I first played it through. Yeah, mine's Farangar. This is. I wonder why. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> I mean, I the, the worst thing is that th- there's a lot of jokes about my channel that, that basically they happened because. I jo- I made the joke first, and then people just started copying. But this Farangar thing just came out of nowhere. I still don't know. People keep comment. So to this day, I receive comments almost every week one that says you sound a little bit like the White Run Court Wizard. And I don't know. It's it's so funny because it's one of the few jokes that I didn't even think of myself. <laughs> Um, I think personally, my favorite character has to be uh, the illustrious Fargoth. I mean, look at this man. Look at its face. He's look at his ring. A beauty. He's a beauty. Wow. Look at that time that you stole his ring from him. <laughs> oh, I don't just steal his ring. I steal all the stuff in his tree stump as well. <laughs> Damn, Amethias. Chaotic <laughs> evil, are we? <laughs> my first playthrough was Telvani. What more do you want from That... 
Okay, that's fair. That's <laughs> I just used the creation kit to basically make sure that his house is no longer his house and that <laughs> I just don't despawn in there. So I steal his house. Cool. Nicely done. Damn, son. <laughs> All right, last question. Uh, thoughts on Shirley Curry, the Skyrim grandma, being put into Test 6? It's fantastic. I love it. it. It shows that they actually care about us. As long yeah, as we it, don't cost money. It's, <laughs> <laughs> it's, re it's really, really nice that, they, that they've done it. Um, they've, I just think that they've... I don't know whether it's the influence of Zos or just how they've done things in general, but ESO, ESO and this inclusion of Shirley Curry means, uh, means they are kind of listening to what people are, are asking for and... And trying to give trying to give the fans what they want in in some sense, and yeah, it's it also goes back to, to quite a bit of the way that Bethesda has operated historically as a company. I mean, the names of the divines are just the names of the original playtesters scrambled for crying out loud. So it's it's but it's a really nice touch, and at the same time, really quite in character. I do think it's a great return to form for them, especially after the fiasco that has been the last couple of years for the Bethesda studios. I think it's great that they're showing that, look, guys, we do care about this community and we don't want to just like leave you guys hanging. And we are grateful about what you do. So I'm hoping that this gesture uh, turns out to be one where they carry forward and don't just like leave us on a limb. So with all that, I'm, I have high hopes. Never let your hopes be too high yeah. because you're always going to be disappointed. Yep, I agree entirely. <laughs> I just, I just, my expectations are basically just that The Elder Scrolls 6 is just Skyrim's engine and also Skyrim's 2011 graphics just with a different map. <laughs> if, you if you expect that, I mean, you're, you're not going to be disappointed. True. I'm actually fully expecting Elder Scrolls 6 to just be Skyrim, just with a nice e and over the top. <laughs> you fall at 76. Elder Scrolls 5 and a half, Skyrim plus Beyond Skyrim Bruma. Yeah, we stole that. What? It's our engine. Okay, with that, we are done with the second episode of the Lodcast with our guest, Aramithius. And Thank you guys, it's been a pleasure. I, I, do you have anything you'd like to say before we end? Uh, I don't think so at this point, no. I've been... <laughs> I, think I've, I, think I've said more, I think I've said more than enough. I can ramble if you like, but I have my own podcast for that. <laughs> yep. And don't forget to go check out his stuff. I'll put links in uh, the description at the end of the video. Uh, he, he makes a lot of good stuff. And it's probably the most well-informed lore that I've ever heard in a while. So, Like that, I said when I introduced him, he is our resource for lore. <laughs> yeah. So with that, thanks for watching or listening, whatever one. And see you guys next time. Bye. Fuck, I died again in Blades. Deuces. See you guys. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> Slender teed fall. Full side of a king. Zu'u. Korav need no dove to high. Try me and you'll regret it. You do not even know our tongue, do you? I fought wars more ferocious than you. Do you? Do you? I've got a bone for you. I don't have a lot of patience for questions, Elven.